Hello, everybody. It's John Pollock and Wei Ting here on a Friday afternoon, a special free bonus show where we are going to go through the G1 card from earlier today in Shizuoka. And then we are going to talk about a lot of news items as well. Hello, Wei. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing um, exceedingly well. Mm, I like that. A carefully thought out. How are you doing response? Appreciate that. You know, you got to pause. You got to really think like, what state of mind am I in? I'll tell you what I feel like over the last 48 hours. I feel like I have been, uh, I've been out for a long time and my, my iPhone, which is me was like on red <laughs> and I finally found a charger. It feels wonderful. Oh, I think I'm in need of, of uh, one of those charges. I mean, I definitely need a bit of a, a power boost. I'm definitely feeling um, the effects of the week. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff. So this G1 was was not an easy one to to get through for me personally. Well, was this one you logged in and saw the three hour runtime and said, "Christ"? Um, yeah. I mean, not maybe not so much, but maybe during some of the matches. You know, once we got into some of those. Anyway, we will get to it a bit later. You know what this G1 could have used? A Stadium of Horrors match. <laughs> so have you listened to the uh, BWE transfer? So I went out last night. And I, I was in my car. So I listened to the entire thing. This was such a fun show. And I say this uh, understanding that this is, you know, one of our one of our in-house uh, shows. But I would say this regardless. This was so enjoyable that listening to it, I just thought to myself, this is much less a podcast. And this was like five friends that I that you were listening to it was just a fun discussion like a fantastic show fantastic concept I loved it oh they did a great job absolutely you know you too you were involved in this I I I didn't have much to do with it I was merely a guest but uh yeah Martin Benno and Jamesy who uh I think were very much responsible for the concept of this whole thing they uh I was so glad that they were able to invite me and yeah it's it's just a great opportunity to be able to I don't know, have an excuse to talk to other members of, of the post wrestling family and, and a great chance to hear Jamesy again on the airwaves. So oh, or when on I heard that voice. Airwaves, I mean, yeah. Uh, just just wonderful to hear Jamesy who The backstories, uh, amazing. Oh, his I loved his card. I honestly believe I would be I would if if I was pressed, okay? His is the card I'm paying my money for, but in the lead up to it. Uh, separating yourself from it, your card would be the one I would be use, using to get your reaction to in the weeks leading up to it of this card is nuts. This is the thriller of pro wrestling. And as you, you were so uh, entertaining because I'm trying to figure out with each ensuing pick of yours, I'm like, what does he have at play here? What is he building? Because these are not random picks in any sense. And when you dropped the Iconics for the st- Stadium of Horrors, that, that is the most must-see match of the entire selection, Uh, but some great picks. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm not, I I have a feeling I know who you're voting for, but I will not ask point blank. Um, But if you do listen to it, everybody, and if you want to go take a look at all of our cards and you want to vote, just go to postwrestling.com slash BWE. Great job by all involved, uh, including myself. Yes. But um, it was a very entertaining show and a wonderful project to be a part of. So, and, and a lot of reaction to it so far. So they will announce the winners on the next edition of the BWE, which is in about two weeks' time. So get your votes in before that. Ben XT. I mean, there were some, there, there are some great cards there. <laughs> I mean, just some, Kate's uh, unscrewed in Montreal card. Yes, wonderful. Uh, man, Andrew had some Andrew had some zingers in that in that show. Oh, he did. Don't yes. lie, Shane Thorne. You're not having fun. It was a <laughs> awesome show. Great show. I highly recommend people checking that out. As I do recommend all of our great coverage that we have at the Post Wrestling Cafe. We've got a busy month in October. The G1 coverage is only going to get uh, amplified as the weeks continue. We have three weeks remaining of the G1. So if you are a cafe member or an aspiring one that has grown up wanting to be a member of the Post Wrestling Cafe, and now you can finally make that big dive. It's the best time of the month to do so. It is October the 1st, and signing up will get you access to every single G1 bonus show. We are also going to have two Rewind Aways coming up this month. We are going to have uh, coverage of 
the G1 Finals. We're going to have another Ask Away. We have live shows multiple times a week. It's a steal. Steal it from us. Just rob us right now. Go ahead, please. At $6 a month, you basically are. And, of course, Rewind a Smackdown and Rewind a Rampage every single Friday night, uh, including tonight. So this is a free show right now, but we invite all cafe patrons and would-be cafe patrons to join us tonight as we go through the WWE draft and tonight's edition of Rampage. That is correct. So we will be back live tonight, 1115 Eastern, night one of the draft, Rampage, and your phone calls to look forward to. Let's move on over to news items and Uh, I just wanted to start off, this is kind of world news, but certainly applies to kind of what we are discussing throughout the G1. Uh, Japan has lifted its state of emergency in Friday, uh, this covering Tokyo and 18 other uh, prefectures, as they're easing restrictions now on bars, restaurants, large-scale events, which includes sporting events, can now increase their attendance from five to 10,000 people. And as of Thursday, or at least on Thursday... There were 1,576 cases in the country. Um, They had hit uh, almost 26,000 on August the 20th uh, as a comparison point. And as well, kind of uh, relatable to pro wrestling is that fully vaccinated travelers from outside of Japan, they will still need to quarantine coming into the country, but they have reduced the period from 14 to 10 days. So that is the latest on Japan as they're, uh, vaccination rate has increased, and it appears you know they are they they are moving ahead now with uh, the easing of restrictions, but still obviously prevalent restrictions still in place in some areas. You know, it's a step in the right direction, at least. You know, and after all these months of I think um, the opposite news and the whole ordeal with the Olympics, I mean, it's it's really a bit of positivity uh, with you know COVID in Japan is is a very good sign. You know, Kevin Kelly did address it at the end of the, the broadcast today. He says it won't have any immediate effect on the G1. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we hope towards the later events in the calendar year and beyond, uh, things are going to get back in order for New Japan as well as their international roster. So now now they can uh, they can house 10,000 people if they want to run more stadium events. This, I mean, that will, if things stay at this, this rate, I mean, that certainly has an impact when you're running the Tokyo Dome twice in January and as well, where they will be in several months if if there's further allowances for for people. Like here in Toronto, uh, they've now increased the Rogers Center can go up to 30,000 people. I know, and it's making me want to go see a Jays game, even though I... <sighs> Don't otherwise would I otherwise would really not be that interested. But well, um, they're also playing important games, so that helps too. Oh, okay. See, I'm not even aware. Oh. But you know these these New Japan shows. I I know people aren't really interested in this year. I am barely interested. I don't know if, how much I'd be watching on this G1 if I wasn't covering it. But I do think it it will be important to remember what these shows feel like, what the state of New Japan is at this moment. Because I think in a year's time, things will be very different. You know, in the moment that, like, they get the international roster back in, the moment that these fans are allowed to actually take their masks off and be able to uh, make noise. Mm -hmm. um, Well, like, in one year's time, the difference between this product and the New Japan product of potentially, you know, knock on wood, you know, of a year from now will be very drastic. So it's something to look forward to. Dynamite on Wednesday night, uh, ratings coming from Showbuzz Daily and Brandon Thurston. They were number one on cable with 1,152,000 viewers, 588,000 or 0.45 in the 18 to 49 demo. Uh, They were down from the week before and where they really were hurt was among their female audience. Uh, Women 18 to 49 were down 21%. Women 12 to 34 down 33% from the week before, and their 18 to 34 audience down uh, 23%. But they have certainly settled into this audience of, you know, they have since the second week of July, they've dipped under a million viewers twice, and they were just slightly under. So I think we can look at the the overall um, performance of AEW. They have increased their audience, and just looking at September of this year, Versus September of last year, which were the Daily Place shows, um, in both the demo and total viewers, they're up 32% year over year. So that is the the change we have seen in Dynamite. Um, but this was 
I guess this was a curiosity episode way because as we mentioned going in, it did not have the the level of buildup as Arthur Ashe Stadium or even the Prudential Center. This was more so of a kind of a more of a baseline dynamite. Um, but I, I think people are focused on kind of the the female viewership and being able to retain more of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, overall, I think it's a very positive look for AEW not having to advertise any significant role for a CM Punk or a Daniel Bryan on the show and still doing over a million. Um, I think overall very positive, but it does highlight perhaps, you know, a, a continuing clearing issue with AEW and, you know, I mean, I personally believe like you don't necessarily have to only like, like what, female viewers aren't only interested in watching women's wrestling, but of course it does. No, continue. That's a misnomer. That, yeah. Yeah. But, but of course it does continue to highlight, you know, something, the, the, the lack of diversity in, in, in women and, in uh, you know, um, I guess, uh, uh, black wrestlers on the on the main mix, uh, I suppose, in in AEW. Um, and it's you know, I, I guess the more these issues are are at least discussed and talked about, the more I think we will see them directly address it on TV. Um, they this was a week where Raw um did top them in the eighteen to forty nine demo. However, um, AEW they were ahead with with men eighteen to forty nine. Um, so that was that was interesting to see as well in Canada. It was only available through streaming uh, if you want to watch it live on TSN Direct due to soccer coverage on TSN 2. Uh, they did air the two-hour replay at 11 p.m. on TSN 5 and did 36,000 viewers. But again, when, when there's like a major uh, programming change for uh, AEW or WWE in Canada, it, it's not always that well publicized. I think a lot of people are just tuning in and finding it out uh, in real time. Unless, of course, you're going to postwrestling.com and then you would know well in advance. Honestly, like, I think you are responsible for a big chunk of the people finding out. Honestly, you, like one person, because I wouldn't have known otherwise. And I cover this stuff. Um, It's I don't know, in many ways, like I think wrestling has come so far in terms of how how important it seems to be for um, at least our sports broadcasters in Canada. But in other ways, it still feels like it's sort of a bastard child that, you know, okay, like, I don't know, we'll just kind of give them whatever they want or or, or whatever. They'll they'll be happy with whatever they can get type of thing. But soccer is important, too, I guess. As was Roads to the Top on Wednesday night, which had its premiere episode. So this was interesting because I watched this on Wednesday night. It came on on eCanada at 1030. And I watched it and it ended with coming up this season. And I watched it and it was the next day that I found out this was a one hour show. I was like, what? I watched this. It was 30 minutes. And there was a whole other half to this show, um, which in essence, it... It was all grouped together. It really could have been two episodes because the first half does feel much like the introduction. And the second was all about this wedding shower. Um, but way you has, you have also had a chance to uh, see the first episode. And I thought my original uh, analysis of this was that the first 30 minutes I watched, I thought that this is a, an appealing show because the central focus was still at the wrestling arena backstage. And this was going to be an easy jump on point. If you are an AEW fan to kind of see that aspect of it. And then it was the latter half where they kind of get away from the arena and it's much more just central to Cody and Brandy are the focal points, but even more so with the, with the baby shower and such and are amazing how they caught this uh, rivalry right on camera with Jade Cargill and, Red Velvet, and um, this was I, – I can't believe that the cameras are rolling and, and caught all of this. There was there was no sense of this being contrived in the least for me. Oh, man. Well, you know, you just people – they get really lucky, these uh, reality show producers. You know? It's like they're around all these cameras, and suddenly it's it's just like a fly on the wall that you don't even realize <laughs> that you're having these – these heart to heart conversations and then coming nearly coming to blows with one another uh, as you're doing wine tasting and mm-hmm. boom, we've got all of it. Like not since wrestling with shadows has such material. Just thank God there was a documentary film crew. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, listen, everybody like uh, I, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of reality TV and um, I don't watch it any differently than I do professional wrestling. 
especially when it comes to what AEW is doing here. Let's, you know, let's let's not just forget the fact that this is a vehicle to promote this wrestling promotion to its existing audience, but also more importantly, a different wider audience. And, you know, the selection of people like a to feature like Jade Cargill or Red Velvet is incredibly deliberate. This is their vehicle. I mean, for people complaining that they they don't get enough airtime in storyline development, that is their storyline development. This is their push. And I thought it was relatively effective in that sense. Um, it was an entertaining, I would say pretty, like, in many ways, generic re- uh, reality document- documentary style type of show. Um, did you watch this by yourself? I did watch it by myself, yeah. Oh, I think everyone wants to know your... She would have, this, yeah. Would this, would this I, hold up? Just timing wise, it didn't work out. You know, I had to watch it before um, other things, so I just uh, snuck it in myself. But it was enjoyable. Like I think, um, I it, really liked it in the half hour format. I watched it in an hour is a lot for me to, is it, to watch. Is it this. an hour from this point forward? I think so, but don't quote me on but that. But then is E only showing half of it in Canada? Again, that's another great question. Like they aired. Like it was just in the one slot, so next week I'll I'll look and see if it's putting the whole hour or not. Um, mm-hmm. I'm under the impression it's an hour. Well, for me, like I enjoyed it much in the same way I enjoyed Total Divas in that, like it peeks you behind the curtain of professional wrestling just enough to kind of maintain the interest of the wrestling fan. This one, I think, a lot more so because I know I think you know they know that this is following Dynamite and therefore they are going to try to hook much of the wrestling fan. I also appreciate the fact that they they didn't really kind of like hold your hand with like a lot of wrestling. I don't know, insider terminology. It's like they, they, they speak as if you already know what a promo is. If you, you know that you, I don't know, there is an introductory element to AEW within it, but it's also not like wrestling is scripted and you, we play good guys and we play bad guys. It's just like, you know, you're, you're kind of let in on it. Um, your enjoyment of, I think, Cody and Brandy will vary depending on how much you like Cody and Brandy as personalities. No doubt they are strong personalities, Brandy especially, and I think it makes her, it makes both of them really perfect candidates for a show of this nature. Um, but uh, this is going to be a lot of them, and if you don't like them, then maybe you won't like the show as much. But nonetheless- it's, it's certainly going to be held on your interest in yeah cody and brandy but i mean this this is the kind of thing that is going to get fresh eyes on aew that are not tuning in and that's maybe that is not going to trickle down to watching your wrestling product but that's okay um this is another hour of aew content that they can get paid for and we have seen the success that wwe had going into this genre and i think that that's uh the numbers for this first episode were surprisingly very good. Do we know the do you know, do we know the breakdown? Do we know like the the um, gender breakdown? I don't know what the gender breakdown is. Um, See, that's but- what I'm. I mean, in the first week, maybe that's not even such a big metric to you know uh, put that much value into. But as the weeks progress, I'm I'm going to be curious how much of the guys stick around and how much of the women. Uh, will they will they gain that that will be different from a dynamite audience? Well, I'll tell you this: just comparing it to dynamite, like obviously they're doing a fraction of the dynamite demos, but in looking at what held up, like women eighteen to forty nine, uh, it was a point two three for dynamite and a point twelve on this show, whereas men eighteen to forty nine, a point six seven on dynamite, a point two three for this show, so a drastic decrease. Um, Whereas women, I mean, they were much more likely to stick around and watch this in that mm. in that demo. Uh, but surprising to me, maybe not to everyone, but um, in every one of the demos that Showbuzz monitors, Roads to the Top topped NXT except for adults over the age of 50 and with total viewers with over 50 um, – you know, pushing NXT. They did many more viewers, but in all of the demos, including 18 to 49, uh, it was Roads to the Top ahead of NXT. Um, will it stay at this level? This was the first week for Roads to the Top. We shall see. But I think that's pretty telling right there that uh, this is the show that is, you know, this is AEW's number three show against WWE's number three show. And it was, I, I was just, I didn't even think of it going in of how these shows would compare. Didn't even cross my mind until I, inserted these numbers into my sheet here and compared them. I was like, Jesus Christ, they topped NXT across the board here, except for 50 plus. Yeah. Uh, 
it's 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 a fun narrative to i guess weave you know it's um i mean i just look at them as so different though like the shows are different the nights are different the competition is different and i think their aims are different um but I, you know it's fun to i guess make these comparisons and, and play these games i suppose i don't think it's that crazy way it's two shows that are aimed at wrestling fans and they're watching more of this versus your nxt program what about like, Miz and misses what about total divas like what are the what are the numbers those ones do uh Miz and misses does considerably more yeah like would those not be more accurate bases of comparison if we're comparing reality tv uh we're talking about two nights of the week and i think this is just more glaring of where nxt has has fallen to that it is at this level that you would not necessarily be comparing to a roads to the top yeah yeah i mean the the numbers are 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 at least you know this week not really trending very well so um the new tuesday wednesday war i guess between these two companies i guess uh uh goes on i uh just going back to the show itself you know they did spend some time talking about ricky starks and his injury uh you know with i, I would say yeah relatively compelling i think appearance from ricky starks you notice noticeably very upset about having to miss three months of action um again you know this what i think the one of the major values of the show will be will be to feature and highlight some real life or what seems like real life stories of some of these uh, lesser featured acts on the show um i'm something that i i really didn't like though and again the whole thing is a work everybody like it's it's reality tv it's pro wrestling but when you mentioned to me that they were focusing on the cody rhodes controversial what has become an infamous infamously controversial promo that he cut on anthony gogo uh in this first episode i was certainly curious to see how they would frame it because coming out of it i would say that was a promo that was largely met with um negative mm, you know like reaction from it was it was decided it was derisive to say the least like there was certainly um mixed reaction to i really don't i didn't see much positivity coming out of it i mean i think people could appreciate the fact that it was like an impassioned speech but i at least to me like felt most of the audience and you can look at the reaction cody went on to receive after that from that point forward you know it's it was like I think a criticism of it being him trying to hit notes um, to exploit maybe, um, I don't know, um, deeper feelings of tension uh, with regards to race in America for the purpose of a, of a, of a storyline that didn't really warrant it. Um, you know, like oversimplification of, I think um, racism being solved at a time when clearly there it is not. Yet in the show, they presented it as if it was just this straight up big triumphant moment. Cody going out there, you know, cutting the lines about like him and Brandy having a mixed race baby and Brandy uh, legitimately tearing up in the back. But then no real coverage of, you know, the fallout from it, which I thought was the most interesting thing. And to me would have been a sign about how far the show was willing to go beyond, I think, what it's scripted to go, where it's scripted to go. Clearly, like, I mean, they covered it as if it was like they knew already the ending even before Cody went out there and cut the promo. But to me, the result coming out of the promo was far more interesting. I, I, I would have loved to have seen, like, if they reacted, you know, backstage or at least like in the days afterwards, Cody seeing some of the online reaction to this and and them reacting to that. But it didn't really go that level. And, and that's all for me to say that. You know, it does feel a, very much like a cookie cutter reality TV in, in that they know their beginning, middle and end almost like before they even do the action. Yeah, I think that it um, I, I th especially when you see the scenes for later in the season where they are going to um, go into uh, Cody and like segments that fell apart and mixed reactions from the crowds. It's like to, to actually explore that. It does seem that would have played into the stories we are going to be telling later on in the season anyway, save for the fact as well that I think it just, it is kind of more interesting if Cody had this idea of not knowing how this promo would land with people. And it was mixed. I mean, it was, I think like they handed you something that you could have certainly incorporated in a more interesting way rather than uh, Cody, like, man, nailed it. Let's bake a cake. Let's bake a slam cake. Okay. Um, Huge news out of Impact Wrestling. Coming up at Bound for Glory.
a six-person uh, match will determine the holder of their newest championship way, the Digital Media Champion. The Digital Media Champion of Impact Wrestling. Yes, this uh, this made some headlines. John Cena alerted me yesterday about it. I mean, you know, wrestling... Um, I don't know if wrestling needs more belts, but I mean, if you're Impact Wrestling... Maybe it wrestling, won't be a belt way. Maybe it will be like a Dropbox link. Ooh, okay. A uh, e-belt? Yes. Like maybe a badge? A flare on your avatar? It'll be like a like a QR code or Ooh, or a blue check mark on your Twitter profile. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, two people fight and the loser gets they has to they have to change their Twitter name and yeah. lose their their verified status. Yeah, I, I I definitely saw maybe a lot of maybe uh, uh people make, kind of making fun of the concept. It's it's at least something that's getting people talking and um maybe it's hard to really kind of talk about whether or not it'll work until we actually see it in action. Like how what exactly makes this a digital media championship? You know what? Uh, I would say that introducing this title on your one-hour pre-show, um, going against the linear competition that is the second hour of Dynamite that night, might not be the best way to introduce this new championship because I don't know how many people are going to be watching this pre-show going against Dynamite. But what exactly is digital media about it? Like, what are the responsibilities of the champion? Uh, probably a lot of uh, Zoom interviews. Maybe you have to get like a certain ratio of uh, retweets and likes for every post. Um, Maybe that could be a competition. Like two guys, instead of we we settle it in the ring, we we settle it on Twitter. We both drop uh, promos on Twitter, and whoever gets the most retweets gets the title. Um, I mean, th- the idea here is the the evolution of what used to be the television championship. We're living in a world now where it is digital media. So oh, I get it. So that's it. Okay, that's the concept. So as arbitrary as a concept as like a TV title has become, they are just simply changing it to like a digital media championship. Okay. Yes. Interesting. So it will only be defended uh, within digital media, digital airspace? Well, they're doing in six the... seconds. They have to defend the belt in a TikTok. <laughs> six second match. You should be running this division. That, is, really that is clearly what is. Hey, this is going to be a lot better than the 24-7 championship. We can, we can state that as fact. Uh, but they will be doing the qualifying matches, which are going to include men and women on um, – they're going to be putting the matches all online. And then the six will uh, square off on the pre-show on October 23rd, which is Bound for Glory. I think that that concept is probably the most interesting part of it. The fact that this is a, an intergender championship, that mm-hmm. men can face women for it. And uh, everybody should probably have equal – I don't know um, – chances at least storyline wise to, to to earn it i i find that probably the most interesting part of it all what if there is a new heel female character that comes in to go after this championship anna log <laughs> oh that'd be wonderful well wait, wait just kick me off the championship committee no no i i'm i'm signing you up for the next uh world transfer window i think that's perfect <laughs> I think I think analog would have been perfect for like the uh, the pillow fighting league. Analog, I'm, I'm uh, honestly honestly surprised. Yeah, um, <laughs> it would have been a character that would have come out like with the rotary dial phone, perhaps. Um, Comes out with like all the VHS. streaming stats of like how people still watch television in enormous percentages compared to streaming. Yep, she she will proclaim that VHS is the superior format. Um, I don't know records audio i don't know whatever yeah that's a that's wonderful uh coming up this weekend i, I want to make mention of this that uh, noah has their semifinals and final of the n1 victory tournament they're going to be running core q and hall on sunday with kaito kiyomiya versus uh, keno and katsuhiko nakajima against masakatsu finaki and what wrestle universe is doing which is where noah airs ddt tokyo joshi pro is starting today the streaming service is free for the rest of the year on the condition you pay for the month of January for 900 yen. And that would include Noah's January 1st show at Budokan Hall. So an interesting um, concept to try and, you know, try and get some uh, added numbers to your Wrestle Universe service, which has a yeah. lot of quality stuff. I just don't know if it's, if it's people's priority when they're committing to a monthly streaming service, but it's a good time to do it, like just starting with this show on Sunday that should have some fantastic stuff. And it also comes with all the DDT stuff. This will have their, um, yeah, like three months of shows. I think it's a great idea. Can you remind me again what it is? So if you pay for this month, 
and you get the you, rest of the year for free. I think it's I haven't done it, but I think you have to sign up and probably input your information uh, and probably your credit card number. And then they'll charge you January. So you have to pay for January, but you get October, November, December as free. OK, so you're getting so, like th- three months free. It sounds yeah, like with the promise that you pay for January. Right, right. And and what if you don't live up to the promise? Well, my guess is that you're again. I'm guessing here that you have to. Do you in, swear you'll pay for January. You promise. You promise. <laughs> you can't go back on this. I'm guessing um, they charge you up front. For, that's what for I'm January. thinking. I'm thinking you or you get billed at the end of it, but you are going to get billed for at least one month, and then it's probably on you to opt out if you don't want to keep it after January. I really do think it's it's great. You know, you're talking about a time where so many people have already subscribed to so much, and but if you're somebody who's on the fence. You've heard about this this Noah t- tournament. You've heard about DDT. You've heard about what they're doing in Tokyo Joshi Pro. If you're on the fence about it, um, this is going to be something that I think will put some of those people over the top. I would love to see other, uh, you know, streaming services that are sort of on that fringe of you know people this make taking the plunge and signing up full time to to take a similar step. I feel like we would I would do it for our Patreon if like if we had the technology, but Patreon doesn't really allow that. No. Um- but also, uh, I just had some of the, the notes sent to me, but uh, Wrestle Universe relaunches on Friday afternoon with a new interface and uh, it'll have a time shifting function. You can switch between English and Japanese commentary and uh, the English commentary on the Noah cards, like with Stuart Fulton and Mark Pickering. Like it's, it's really strong stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what Noah has coming up uh, this weekend with the N1 tournament. And then tonight... Uh, SmackDown has the draft, which I'm sure will have uh, an enormous amount of news coming out of it. And that is followed by Rampage with Brian Danielson against Nick Jackson, Jade Cargill, Nyla Rose, and Thunder Rosa in a three-way, and Orange Cassidy versus Jack Evans, hair versus hair. Busy Ooh, weekend. Who's their hair? Big, uh, big question mark, unless you're, uh, you have already found out the answer. Uh, but let's get on to the G1 card from Friday morning in uh, Shizuoka. Attendance of 1,101 and Kevin Kevin Kelly solo on this uh, particular evening. We started off with Yoshinobu Kanemaru and Ryohei Oiwa in the non-tournament match. And Oiwa is a lot of fun to watch. He's, you know, demonstrates all the foundational skills you see out of a lot of of the young lions. And this was a chance for him to... um, convey how messed up your knee is and he just sold this knee for most of the way after being sent into the guardrail he's clutching at it he's limping Kanemaru blocks a Boston Crab attempt and then uses his own half crab drills the knee into the mat and figure four wins the match in 748 and Kanemaru um barely breaking a sweat but um quick opener I didn't get a chance to watch it so I'll take your word for it it was fine Tamatonga Jeff Cobb was our first tournament match of the show. Uh, Tamatonga was hilarious at various parts. Both of these guys had like their lines. Like Tonga would go and leap and get caught by Jeff Cobb, and you just hear him because it's so quiet. You can hear everything. Oh shit! <laughs> so every time he get caught, he just swears. Um, there's a splash attempt, and he's caught and tossed with a belly to belly, and Cobb takes over. Uh, Thomas stops him with the Volano, followed by a big splash and a Death Valley driver. But Cobb beats him down, and he tells him, You ain't shit. Your podcast ain't shit. Your family ain't shit. And Tamatong is like, You do not speak about my podcast in those terms. <laughs> it was. It might have been the first time I've ever heard um, somebody insult somebody else's podcast. You bitch. Uh, in the middle of a match. So... Man, they know how to get. Listen, you ever, do you ever, somebody insulted our podcast, John? I think I would try to deliver a tongue and twist to him. Um, speaking of like threats uh, made inside wrestling rings, has there been more of um of a twenty four hour cycle than what we have seen Arn Anderson get from Wednesday's promo? Uh, I really haven't been following. What do you mean? Is there? Oh my god! Just dude, the, all the, the memes going back, finding other promos where he has promised death. <laughs> uh, dude, uh, you knew like Conrad and company would have a shirt out immediately. Uh, it was just, it's amazing. Like what this Glock promo. Uh, it just to me, it was like that was my timeline. Yes, it was surrounded by this promo. Um, I don't know. It's, 
I, I guess, you know, it, it was a pretty graphic description, but to me, it was like, it was the perfect Arn Anderson promo of what you would imagine Arn Anderson to say as a motivational tool. Totally worked. Absolutely. And um, I, I think he should run with this. <laughs> like, how... I, I don't want to see him walk to the ring with a Glock every week. I think that would be a little much, but I mean, oh, it's dude, a con- concealed weapon, concealed weapon. He, all he has to do is just like, re- like, you know, threaten to reach to lift his shirt up and you know. Yeah. I mean, it's given people an, uh, an excuse to go back and revisit. Uh, th- there was one promo that I've seen many times, but it got reposted where uh, it's him cutting a promo on the NWO right as they had int- uh, been introduced and stating how, they're at odds now with the horsemen, the original gang. Said, as they say, send one of ours to the hospital, we send one of yours to the morgue. Yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, and you believe it when you think of it, when you hear him say it, you know? Absolutely. I love it. I love so it. I, I love I, I've sung the praises of Arn's promos for forever. And I think everyone is, you know, clearly seeing what a, again, folks, 18 years in WWE. And this Look man was this. behind the scenes. Look at this on Conrad's uh, and Arn Anderson's like shop. It's like God. They've got the Arn Soprano style shirt already. That's the one I saw. Did they have more than one? They've got now Armed Anderson as well. <laughs> Armed Anderson. That's up to six XL. Fuck! Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Um. Anyway, Armed Anderson. So. Uh, Armed Anderson. Fuck. There you go. That's good. Uh, the match. Oh, okay. We get we get to the end of this. And the gun stun gets blocked, and then he goes for another gun stun. And as he leaps into the air, Cobb catches him with a German suplex and hits the Tour of the Islands. What a fantastic final sequence. In 1247, Cobb gets the win. Tamatonga is quietly having these amazing closing sequences to his matches, like he did with Tanahashi. Um, the gun stun, it just gives you so much leeway to come up with creative stuff, but this might have been my favorite one. I just thought the, the gun stun into the German was, I loved it. Yeah, he's been uh, getting creative with it. I mean, it, it is... You know, like the standard has had been set with DDP and, and Orton really took it to another level. But why not use it as uh, your main trick here coming into this G1? So I, 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 I was it was definitely interesting seeing Tamatanga work as a baby face here. I don't know if I've really seen it before other than maybe another G1s. But here I found it an interesting choice because I don't know if I would have went that way. Like I felt if anything, Cobb was probably for me, at least the more the character more capable of, of drawing sympathy. Um, I don't know how effective this was, but it also to me began a night where I really felt like, I don't know if it was just a venue um, because like even in these pandemic crowds, these crowds have at least made a bit more noise, uh, maybe even a lot more noise than what I felt I heard tonight. So it definitely affected my enjoyment of almost all the matches, how silent it was. This to me, wasn't one of my, you know, more liked, uh, Tamataka appearances. I kind of felt like it was relatively average. In fact, I felt Cobb's lack of intensity, pretty disappointing i will say like mm, i know wait, his wait i i think you're disagreeing with me yeah i think i am um <laughs> you know like especially I, I think you know i i felt like the effort from a tamatanga performance but like Cobb does some great suplexes but i feel that lack of emotion and intensity is it just kind of makes the match feel a bit mechanical and, and like it was just there so I I've been enjoying both guys in the tournament, but I I did find the match disappointing. So I went medium, one cream. Ooh, I went large, one milk on this one. I I I didn't think it was uh, Cobb's best match, nor Tamatonga's of the tournament. Um, but I hey, I, I'll take some shit talking and that closing sequence. That's enough for me. Um, Podcast like insult. Well, we'll just hit hit us. It's a it's Where a direct message to my heart. Evil versus Chase Owens. Uh, now, this one, I think I was much more um, on the same page in terms of the atmosphere here. There is a part where they do the obligatory Ozaki timekeeper spot. Dude, it was like an episode of Silent Library, and this audience was winning. It, you honestly, there was not a fucking sound among these th- 1,100 people. It was yeah. the quietest I can envision I've ever heard in a new Japan setting. And that's saying something given this stretch that we have seen. 
Yeah, again, you know, we know, of course, like, the crowds can't actually uh, audibly make noise with, like, their voices, but they can at least do the clapping. And we had that, we had golf clapping on the show. Like, we had clapping in moments where I think the crowd felt like it was polite to clap, but, like, no, honestly, no big reactions all the way up until the main event for, like, anything that really seemed to legitimately excite them. Um, and, And, yeah, to me, it was very noticeable. So, of course, we had the Bullet Club members here in Evil and Owens, and they had done the two sweep before, but then Dick Togo is screwing around, tra- uh, tripping Owens. There was a Darkness Scorpion on the floor, and Owens gets in at 18, but Togo pulls him back out, and the count continues, and he races back in at 19. Owens stops the Garrett from being used. I don't know how forgiving I would be if someone tried to, like, choke me out with one of these things, but nonetheless, Owens is very forgiving. Um Finally, they picked up the pace near the end. It was pretty dull up until this point. Um, Togo distracts the referee, so evil hits the low blow, and everything is evil in 12 minutes and 39 seconds. Uh, A really, really boring match. Um, All three made up afterwards. Uh, Owens is dejected. He continues the losing streak. Um, This, to me, was medium territory. I thought this was a totally, totally skippable match. I went medium as well. Yeah, very painfully average, I would say. You know, again, I felt the effort from the babyface performance from uh, Chase Owens here, but otherwise, a pretty standard evil match, some average wrestling, lots of Togo shenanigans. Um, and I would say, again, the crowd, you know, the ba- the, he- the the double heel dynamic didn't really help either. But like with Chase ba- playing a babyface, this crowd didn't really seem to react. So um didn't really work for me. So... We're we're through three of the six matches, and there is a ton of time left on this show. So you knew these remaining matches were all getting some significant time. Um, maybe um, the most surprising of which was Taichi and Yoshihashi that went over 22 minutes. And Taichi early on was choking Yoshihashi with the cable. Uh, he's attacking with kicks while Yoshihashi with the forearms and Taichi would go after the taped up shoulder. Uh Neither would drop during a lariat battle, so Taichi takes a dragon suplex but pops right up, and Yoshihashi runs him over with a lariat, Kumagoroshi, and then applies the butterfly lock. Each connect with big kicks. Yoshihashi is down. The Black Mephisto gets countered with a destroyer by Yoshihashi, only gets a two count, and Taichi stops Karma, kicks him in the shoulder. Yoshihashi just fires back with the lariat, and on the second try, hits Karma for the win in 22 minutes and 26 seconds. Um, I would say they hit their stride in kind of the, those final five to six minutes. Um, I did think this one um, did drag during the early portion, though. I went medium, one cream, one sugar, right in the middle there. Um, you know, to me, it looked like it was a fine match, but definitely maybe a bit longer than it deserved to be, given the relative lack of star power and this only being the third match um, in the tournament on the show. I it, I did find it tough to connect to this one, much like the others. So maybe it was just the crowd. Maybe it was the combo of two participants that just simply don't interest me all that much it, it, between the two of them when they're together. But I really didn't have a whole lot to say about it. You know, the story was seemed to be built up here to, to be this big underdog win for Yoshihashi. Um, but um, that was about it to me. So Taichi now... Uh... Goes up to six points, and Yoshihashi still at zero. Okada versus Hiroki Goto. This was their first singles match since 2016. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yoshihashi won. Oh, sorry, sorry. I totally screwed that up. So Taichi stays at four points, and Yoshihashi moves up to two points. Memorable match for me. Uh, Kazuchika Okada and Hiroki Goto uh, was next. So Okada gets laid out with a DDT on the floor, and he's in control from the beginning Goto goes into the guardrail. Uh, Okada hit the drop kick, applied the money clip. Goto gets to the rope, and then the GTR is blocked. Short arm lariat from Okada. The Ushigoroshi gets avoided by Okada, and then a spinning rainmaker is ducked. He's hit with the reverse GTR, and Goto is going for the kill. But the GTR gets countered. Okada stops a strike and responds with a back body drop while hooking the legs. His, uh, 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 Finish that he goes to fairly often, and he catches Goto in 18 minutes and 8 seconds, and they noted it was Okada's first G1 win this year without the Rainmaker, and Goto continues to be frustrated as he understands his reality, and that is, I am at the same level 
as Chase Owens. He's 0-4 in this G1. Yeah, they are telling a bit of a losing streak story with him. Um, I thought it was a good match, you know, quite active. I, I like the match, yeah. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, I just don't have anything much to say about it. It just felt very standard fare for these two. I do feel like there's probably a story there that I wasn't necessarily latching on to between, like, you know, these two Chaos members and, I don't know, two people who know each other really well that I just don't... Yeah, I, I will say I think Kevin Kelly did did a great job. He does a great job on his own, but um, the the role I, th- I think there was co- more history you could have gone into, like that whole yeah. 2016 period of Goto feuding with Chaos and ultimately failing and then joining Chaos. I mean, that was kind of the story at the time, it, and yeah, it, it, I think it, it, you could have gone into that a bit more. Well, it, I think his his absence is certainly noticeable for a match like this. It's a combination that honestly, to me, is not that interesting. And it's also a crowd that really is not here for not making much noise at all. So, like, I think somebody, you know, the contributions of a Chris Charlton to not only give us the history lessons, but also to maybe add a bit of, I think, energy to to the broadcast was was definitely sorely missed, both in this and also in the main event. Um, so, you and, know, and that goes to, you know, and and that's not on Kevin Kelly to have no, to do not play by play and color. He's got mm-hmm. his job to do mm-hmm. and cannot be doing both roles. That's why you have a second person. So um, that's and, and that's clearly something that, you know, Chris Charlton is not going to be present on all of these shows. And this was one of them. Yeah, I still appreciated the effort from both men, especially Goto. I went large one cream. Yeah, I, I went large with, with, with a milk and uh, half a sugar on this one. Half. Half a sugar. Main event, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Sonata. Kevin Kelly notes Tanahashi's G1 record, 89 wins, 57 losses, and 7 draws. It's a lot. It's a lot of G1 matches. Sonata had the advantage early on, and this was a story of the two trying to one-up each other. Uh, Tanahashi did a dragon screw. Sonata came back with one of his own, and then each caught the other's leg, and they agree to release it, but Sonata double-crosses him and hits another dragon screw. Moments later, Tanahashi catches him in the ropes with one. Cloverleaf is applied, and Sonata battles to the ropes. Uh, 20 minutes in, Sonata lands a beautiful springboard dropkick, follows with the TKO, but Tanahashi is still alive. Sling Blade aces high, but the high fly flow lands on the knees. So Sonata goes to the top rope moonsault. He lands on the knees of Tanahashi, and both are showing the, uh, the wares of this battle. There's an O'Connor roll by Sonata for a big near fall as Tanahashi kicks out at the very last second. Tanahashi then rolls, hits a dragon suplex, gets his own near fall, and then just goes to the top. High fly flow. It hits, and he wins in 25 minutes and 36 seconds. They're both down. They're both um, spent from this 25-plus minute match. And Tanahashi jumps up to six points, and Sonata remains at four. I thought it was a very good match. You know, like you look at the runtime, and sometimes you you definitely um, get a little bit concerned. But I thought this this like there was enough activity here and enough story that I thought warranted the length again, like all these matches, I thought it did suffer from a pretty silent crowd, but the match was good. And I thought they very effectively told this kind of story of, a uh, you know, the two of them being mirror images, which, which they have done in the past. Um, again, I think like, you know, having some of that history lesson being conveyed to us between their shared lineages might've maybe boosted the excitement a little bit, but uh, in ring, these two just, I think, have awesome chemistry. I think they they bring out the best in one another. Um, didn't really have the excitement to me to make it like a top-tier match of the tournament, but I thought both performances were, were really strong. So for me, it was just a hair under XL. So large one cream, one sugar, one sleeve. I had the, the same, save for the, uh, the milk cream substitution, as our new free listeners are completely lost at our rankings. But um, this was my favorite match on the show. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I enjoyed Okada Goto. And the closing stretch of Jeff Cobb Tamatonga that uh, might be a polarizing match, but um, that was that was the show. It was a B block show. It had it had its moments. It had its, uh, but it was largely um, pro wrestling for three hours. I think I, I I would recommend the main event for people you know looking to just kind of pick the best matches of these previous nights of the G one. But I Agreed. can't really. I can't really say like it was a show that I feel mm, was rec- worth recommending. Certainly not as a whole. Um, I don't even know if there'd be much I'd recommend B 
beyond the main event. And even if you skip the main event, I don't even think you're missing all that much, you know. And I'm just being honest because, like, there is so much else available right now in professional wrestling that just has such a much bigger energy about it. And it's not a fault of the performers, especially on a show like this. But, um, you know, these crowds are just, like, very difficult. You know, it felt like an empty arena tonight for me. So after today, uh, Cobb and Okada are on top of the B block with eight points. Evil and Tanahashi have six points. Then the next level is Taichi and Sonata with four. Tamatonga, Yoshihashi have two points. And at the bottom are Chase Owens and Goto with nothing. Big fat zero. Um, do we have an update on the contest today? Um, we do. Uh, I've not put it on the site yet. Okay, let me just uh, log in. Sorry, I'm just kind of killing time. Well, while you log in, let me go over the cards for uh, the next sure. two shows. So we are going to be back on Sunday with another uh, G1 show for Cafe members. And that's a big show. They're in Nagoya at Dolphins Arena. The main event is Shingo Takagi against Kota Ibushi, followed by Tomohiro Ishii and Zack Sabre Jr. So two very big matches on the A block. Tangaloa takes on Yujiro. The Great Okan faces Kenta. And then we have two non-tournament matches as Toriyano takes on Bushi and Yoshinobu Kanemaru versus Kosei Fujita. That's followed by Monday's B-Block show at Core q and Hall. They are back there with Kazuchika Okada versus Sonata in the, the continual series of matches that they have had that I'm sure they will tease the time limit on. Hiroki Goto versus Yoshihashi, Taichi versus Jeff Cobb, Tamatonga versus Evil, and Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Chase Owens. All right, we go to our contest results courtesy of Chris Angler. This is, of course, available every after every G1 at postwrestling.com slash G1, where you can find links to all of our coverage. Uh, but we go to Chris's results for the day our top listener standings still sitting atop zach smith at 37 points he is followed by joe sullivan at 35 points and then a three-way tie for third place with d llama hanging in there along with ian j and mario p all with 33 points points in the daily perfect club today which is uh, uh people who have had perfect prediction cards for the day we actually have a number of people including uh anwar starwin kate daniels charlie bustillo daniel mckillwraith gavin spears hank sky robart i fight giants jesse j johnson matt the ace mike defazio monocras postmaster i believe that's uh robert uh s jerry and tommy 1211 so congratulations to all of you for doing so well but the all important C block standings put pitting the post wrestling contributors against one another. We have a new tie for the leadership. Oh my God. It is no longer just Kate from Montreal sitting on top with 30 points. She is joined by Brad, the archivist also scoring uh, 30 points in total. Brad doing very well today with four out of five, whereas Kate only did two out of five for the day. They are followed in second place by Vivian Murray at 27 points. She did very well today with four out of five. Followed by Mark Buckledy making a run from the bottom to the middle of the pack now with four out of five and 25 points. He is tied with Randall Bott at 25 points as well. They are followed by Mike Murray at 24 and Eric Marcotte sitting at the very bottom with 23 points. Well, there you go. It's still anybody's ball game. Uh, so we will continue to monitor this very close C block race. Yeah, always exciting. And if you are looking for uh, where you stand, if you're looking for uh, your predictions, if you forgot what your predictions are, you can find them in the G1 contest posts at postwrestling.com slash G1. All right. And with that, we're going to draw this show to a close. We're back tonight, 1115 p.m. Eastern time for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe and we will have a review of SmackDown and the first night of the draft, Rampage, and then open up your phone calls. Open up the phone lines for your phone calls, which will work way better. Either way, you can call in if you want. Hey, did you see uh, last news item here that the newest member of the WWE broadcast team won Jackie Redmond, formerly of The Score, which I guess is the unofficial WWE broadcasting developmental territory. It really is. I mean, look at the lineage here. You know, Renee, of course, Moro, Arda, 
Berton, and now Jackie Redmond. I mean, uh, who's next? A Nug, maybe next? N- nug on the bump. That to me, that's that, there's my prediction. Nug would be awesome. He would be great on that show. He'd be fantastic, of course. If he hasn't already been on, I feel like he, there's a good chance he might have already been there. I think he was already on uh, one of those commentary shows, was he not? I know that Jimmy's done them. And yeah, um, maybe maybe I missed. It. I don't know what. It, whatever, they'd all be great. They're all very talented people. So yeah, yes. I think she'll be very good on it. Yeah, she she had one drafted, and then yeah, she hosted Aftermath for a time before she went to the NHL Network, and she's going to be hosting Raw Talk and Talking Smack. So that is uh, going to be her initial duties with WWE. So congratulations to her, and we will be chatting. All things WWE and AEW tonight, so tune in for that. Way, as always, it's been a pleasure. At the end of the show, how are you doing? You know, uh, talking to you always energizes me, so I, I'm good. I'm good for another night of G1 right away. Feed it to well, me you right don't now. have to worry about one. You get Saturday off, and then we've got Sunday and Monday. Right, right. Uh, maybe I will watch, uh, what I will do is watch uh, Dark Side of the Ring, which you've had a chance to watch as well. Uh, we won't necessarily be discussing it um tonight but we invite all of you who have watched it and have any comments about the episode which covers fmw to a call in so uh tune in then yes all right thanks everyone for tuning into this free show we'll speak with you tonight